And we're going to be starting in a few minutes. And in the, uh, if you have a moment, just introduce yourself in the chat box so we can see who's here and who's joined us. Thank you for being here. So just go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat box as you join and we'll get started in a couple of seconds. We're glad you're here. Well, welcome everyone. I'm joining you today from the Metro Vancouver region on the west coast of British Columbia, Canada. And it, it is customary in our country to begin a session such as this by acknowledging the indigenous peoples on whose lands we are located. Um, so I'd like to begin this today's session in a good way by expressing my gratitude for being with you all from the respective and shared territories of 10 local First Nations communities that call this region home. And I'd also like to thank the Indigenous peoples currently without lands in our regions, the Métis citizens and the Inuit people for making this meeting possible for us today. And on behalf of all the organizers of today's session, thank you for joining us at the World Circular Economy Forum Accelerator Session on Circularity in Cities and Regions. My name is Vanessa Timmer, and I'm the Executive Director of One Earth, and I'm also a board member on Canada's National Zero Waste Council. Today's session is brought to you by the Circular Cities and Regions Initiative, an exciting one-year pilot to advance circular economy, knowledge and sharing and capacity in the Canadian local government sector. And it was developed and is being delivered jointly by the National Zero Waste Council, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, the Recycling Council of Alberta and Recyc Quebec. And One Earth is proud to be a collaborator on this session with the Circular Cities and Regions Initiative alongside a number of other leading organizations you see listed here, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, the Netherlands Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management, Strong Northern Netherlands, the Circular Economy Leadership Canada, and the OECD. Now at the World Circular Economy Forum, it has been an exciting two days of discussion on the imperative to transition to a circular economy. And over the course of these next two hours, we're going to unpack and discuss the key role of cities and regions in accelerating this transition. And in light of climate change, our carbon budget and ecological limits, it's also urgent we look at the size of the circular economy so that we're living well justly within the Earth's carrying capacity. My nonprofit One Earth collaborates with the C40 cities and the Hotter Cool Institute globally on enabling sustainable levels of consumption and ways of living. And in Canada, we focus on circular demand alongside Van City, the BCIT Center for Eco Cities, the Share Reuse Repair Initiative, because we know that cities and regions are also key to shaping how we live our lives every day and mainstreaming and normalizing lighter living and circular culture. So all of this about cities and regions and circularity, it's a very exciting topic. And we have a dynamic, dynamic group of experts and thought leaders and champions joining us from different cities and countries around the world. I'm honored to be your co-host today with my colleague, Sarah O'Carroll. Sarah, uh, Sarah O'Carroll is the city's lead with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And now I'm gonna invite you in, Sarah. Welcome from your UK studio. It's great to co-host with you today. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I'm really excited to be here. For those of you that have been following the World Circular Economy Forum sessions today, you'll know that one of the sessions before this was the regional deep dive on Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean. And I think this session is a really good follow on from that because we're going to continue the conversation about collaboration, but at a smaller scale, looking at cities and regions. We hope to share many practical examples and stories with you today about how the circular economy is being accelerated in cities and regions and to discuss game-changing place-based innovative solutions that we believe have the greatest potential for impact. Our speakers that we have 
are just a tremendous evidence um, of the leadership that we have for the circular economy at the moment. And our goal really through them and the stories that they're going to, to share with us is to inspire more place-based innovative solutions around the world. As Vanessa mentioned, we really do want you as the audience to engage with us. So please do use the chat to introduce yourself, to let us know who you work for, where you're from, and also to share resources and links with us about the work that you're doing, as well as the work of others that you think we may all benefit from knowing more about. We're also going to be using the Q&A box to take questions from the audience as we go along. We do have a full agenda, but we are going to try to get to as many questions as we can. So please do put your questions into the Q&A box and please do also upvote questions that you would like to hear the answers to. With that, um, I, I think we should get started and, and we should start our conversation today because we have a very full two hours. Um, and so let's start by unpacking one question together, um, both with the audience and then, and then we'll come to our speakers. And that question is why cities and regions? So audience, we'd like to hear your perspective on this. Please, if you can take a moment and type the answer uh, to the end of this question. Cities and regions are critical to the circular economy transition because... Those, that, that instruction will also be pasted into the chat, so we'll give you a little moment to start typing in your answers. I can see we've got lots of introductions um, from the audience, um, and as those answers come through from the audience about why cities and regions are important, I think I'm going to hand over to you, Vanessa, to introduce our panelists today. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, just um, so one point somebody's making is, you know, how can we enable the circular economy for real world applications? And that is a role for cities and regions is to kind of bring it to the practical foundations of how we live our lives in these cities and regions. So it's my pleasure now to welcome uh, over in the Netherlands, our Dutch panel joining us from a studio location. And it's uh, Ms. Cora Smelik from the, region, the regional minister for Flevoland, uh, Mr. Chessa uh, Stelpstra, the regional minister from Drenthe, Mr. John Fernoy, who's the CEO of Omren and chairman of the board of Circulaire Friesland. Mr. Arno Procedier, who's the strategic international advisor on circular economy at the federal government's Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. Welcome and thank you for being with us today. And being a Dutch Canadian, I can also say goeiemiddag, welkom, bedankt. Uh, we're going to hear from you in the second hour. <coughs> But first, I wanted your quick reflections, just a sentence of why cities and regions. Is there a theme or element you think would stand out for you that you'd like to discuss today? So one sentence from each of you. So Cora, let's start with you. Why cities and regions? Well, I think the cities is where it all happens and the region uh, can play a role as a perfect midfielder between the national governments and European and world governments and, uh, and the cities. Great. Thank you, Cora. Chessa. Well, I think we have to go to a circular society and cities and regions are close to the citizens. Right, so it's, yes, that, that, um, that connection to the whole society but also to the citizens. John. Yes, I think that uh, we need cities and regions to uh, put a vision into action. Thank you. Arno. So we need um, a lot of uh, innovations, technical, social uh, innovations, which can't be um, organized by the central government. Um, so we need the city and regional um, networks of uh, businesses uh, um, uh, and um, a society to, uh, to organize that. Thank you. And we're going to be here. Thank you for those initial reflections. We're going to come back to you shortly to hear about the role that provinces play in being a midfielder and creating that innovation that you were just speaking to alongside other key actors in advancing circularity. And next, I want to welcome Joanne Gochi, who's my colleague here. She's in the studio with me here in Vancouver, in the Metro Vancouver region. And she's also a senior advisor for the National Zero Waste Council in Metro Vancouver. And also Oriana Romano, who's the head of unit for water governance and circular economy at the OECD. So Joanne and Oriana are going to speak to us about their programs um, that they have underway to scale up place-based approaches in cities and regions. 
But now I just want your quick reflections on why cities and regions. Let's start with you, Joanne. What do you think is the reason we should focus here? Yeah, thank you very much, Vanessa. I think it really comes down to the potential role of being enablers and facilitators. Um, our cities and regions is where we feel the effects of climate change, of economic instability, biodiversity loss, waste and pollution. So this is really about everything coming together in our cities and regions. Thank you, Oriana. Well, thank you, Vanessa. This is uh, just to say that simply cities are agents for change. Uh, there are the places where learning and innovation can happen and they can definitely lead to the circular economy transition. Great. Thank you, Rihanna. So we'll come back to you later. And we're going to uh, hear now also from three other city leaders speaking about, uh, they're going to speak about their circular city journeys in a moment. Uh, but let's talk about this opening question. And I'll start over with the Director of Policy Planning Outreach for the City of Toronto, Annette Sonovich. Um, so Annette, if you can speak uh, to why circular, why circular cities and regions from your perspective. Yeah, for sure. Uh, cities like Toronto are places of community, commerce, culture, but we're also builders of infrastructure, owners of assets, major purchasers, and consumers of natural resources and also major greenhouse gas contributors. So we have really the ability to influence change as it relates to a circular economy outcomes. Great, thank you, Annette. Uh, we've also got the head of sustainability for Glasgow City Council in Scotland, Gavin Slater. Why cities and regions? Um, well, I think it's, as many others have said, nation states make pledges, but ultimately it's cities and regions that deliver. So the role of cities and regions is, is actually manifesting transition and, and realising the benefits of a circular economy is to implement the policies, plans and actions that truly deliver change. Great. Thank you, Gavin. And we have the, from the city of Cleveland, the chief of sustainability in the United States, Jason Wood. Jason, why cities and regions for you? What would you add to this, um, these sure. reflections? So I think a, a lot of folks have touched on this, but you know, I think cities end up serving as innovation labs, right? And part of it's structural, you know, we're closer to the people, we're the provider of most direct services, we're doing a lot of direct interaction with citizens, so that gives us role, but it's also necessity, right? We know that um, in the U.S. context, at least, that cities tend to disproportionately feel the effects of climate change. We've seen this over and over again, so we have to think differently, and this is really just an extension of that approach towards innovation for us. Great, thank you all so much. So it's so interesting that cities and regions have this interesting role of both being um, a midpoint uh, between society and people or a bridge almost, and also having a number of assets in hand from procurement to infrastructure, and also this innovation potential to really land the action to be agents of change, uh, given the urgency of the crisis. Thank you all so much. I feel like we've really set the stage for our discussion on circularity in cities and regions. And of course, we want to hear more from you um, as you're starting to think about these questions. So for example, Philip, you're mentioning that uh, cities are in touch with those local stakeholders that can create that critical mass of action. And you know that um, you know, there's a number of people also mentioning that the urban population, of course, is going to be the largest place where people will be living. So Sarah, you were mentioning that as well, um, that the latest estimates that we're going to be over 55 to 68 percent by 2050 living in cities and regions. This is the place where action is going to be taking place. And so keep bringing those ideas forward into the chat as well as resources. We'll be posting key resources as well. And you'll also see the bios for each of our speakers coming up as we introduce them. And at this point, I want to hand it back to you, Sarah, to actually dive into the city vignettes uh, with some of the people that you've been hearing. Over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Vanessa. So exactly like you said, knowing that by 2050, two thirds of us will live in cities, that cities consume or contribute to 75% of the world's greenhouse gases. Um, ah, that cities consume 75% of the world's natural resources and contribute to 60% of global greenhouse gas emissions, apologies for that, and produce 50% of global waste. I think it's really important that we have a good conversation um, with our city leaders. And so let's, let's do just that. Let's dig into the circular economy um, journeys of these three very unique and iconic um, cities, Glasgow in Scotland, Toronto in Canada, and Cleveland in the United States with our three 
City champions, Annette, Gavin and Jason. Welcome and thank you so much again for being with us. We have about 40 minutes to have a really good discussion about your circular economy journeys. So we'd like to explore how each of your cities are embracing the circular economy, the benefits that you're realizing from this approach and the actions that you're taking and some insights um, that you could share with other local governments. We will definitely have time for questions from the audience. So I'm just gonna remind our audience once again to put your questions into the Q&A box and to upvote the questions that you'd like to, to hear answered. And we'll do our best to raise as many of them as we can with our city champions. So Annette, Gavin and Jason, to start us off, I'd like to give you each three minutes to tell us about your city's future vision for a circular economy. Um, maybe Gavin in Scotland will we'll come to you first. What is Glasgow's future vision for a circular economy? Well, thanks very much. Um, three, minute, three minutes is a very short time to try and pack in what is a, certainly a very grand vision for the city. Um, but we uh, put our circular economy route map in place um, towards the end of 2020 after delivering a number of small test projects working with uh, our partners in the city. Um, and ultimately, the vision of that is to really drive green economic growth and identify opportunities to help regenerate communities, encourage the growth of the sharing economy, um, support job creation, sustainable business, and um, reuse practices, but, you know, all of the stuff that comes with being a circular city. Um, and our vision is based on initially um, a, you know, a series of future horizon landmarks. And those being, um, for example, in 2025, we'll see a, a ban on textiles going to landfill. Um, we'll also see the introduction of the second phase of our route map, following on from the action plan that we're working on at the moment. The city has made a, a, a very strong commitment to be net zero carbon by 2030. And also in 2030, moving on to the third stage of our circular economy route map. So we have a very... Um, progressive look at making sure we are managing and measuring and maintaining that progress um, before we get to 2045, where we become a circular city as set out in our initial route map. In terms of recent events that have impacted on our circular economy work, Scottish Government have recently announced the, um, the new Circular Economy Minister, which from a national level gives us as a city real support. Um, we've been working very hard on recovering from the pandemic and actually, in all honesty, the pand pandemic actually helped us in uncovering certain aspects that were probably obscured by modern living, by convenience, um, and, and brought to the fore various different approaches to city living, like the 15-minute city, that really support circularity as a concept. Um, and obviously, you may be aware that we have a, a small event on our shores um, called COP26, and that has undoubtedly had an impact on the work that we've been doing in terms of the circular economy and given visibility of the work that we're doing to cities across the world and helping us get connected with networks like this, like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, like the OECD. Um, just some interest information for people that are interested. You can find out more about us through our Sustainable Glasgow Partnership on sustainableglasgow.org.uk, um, which is a... a about governance and business leadership in sustainability and the circular economy. Um, we have collaboration within the city in terms of the Chamber of Commerce and Zero Waste Scotland, which is a Scottish um, government organisation, um, which is really taking the work that we're doing in Glasgow and reflecting that out to other cities in Scotland as well. So showing them how they can join us in the journey to becoming circular, because it's critical that the work we do in Glasgow um, helps to build circular markets for the whole of Scotland and the UK and so on. Obviously, we're working in partnership with Ellen MacArthur Foundation, who have been enormously helpful to us, um, giving us great guidance and expertise, as well as working with um, local partners, if you like, in the UK, like London, on construction projects like the circuit. So our vision is, is detailed, it's ambitious, and we have lots of information that hopefully we can share today with um, the audience. Fantastic. Thank you, Gavin, for those really great opening remarks. It's great to see um, or to hear about the city of Glasgow in the context of both the United Kingdom as well as uh, Scotland, and to also hear about how recent events of the coronavirus pandemic and upcoming events like COP26 have been influencing your vision. Annette, let's come to you next. What is Toronto's future vision for a circular economy? 
Thanks, Sarah. Um, in order to describe what our future vision is, I actually wanted to also share what our uh, intentional journey was towards a circular economy. So in a city like Toronto, we already had a number of progressive programs and policies underway. And when we were undertaking a renewal of our long-term waste management strategy, we really placed a focus on um, intentionally seeking progress towards a circular economy. And what we did there was not only did we um, aspire to achieve uh, you know, zero waste for our community, but we also uh, challenged ourselves to create uh, Toronto as the first circular city in the province of Ontario. Um, in order to do that, uh, we really wanted to make sure that we had the resources dedicated to um, reach and achieve those goals as well. So we uh, formed a circular economy and innovation unit that's been in place since 2018. Um, and because we had that number of programs and services already underway, our first couple of years um, were spent kind of building internal capacity on what circularity could mean for Toronto. We engaged some of our colleagues across city divisions to kind of explain to them the concepts and how they could be applied to their disciplines. Um, and also, uh, you know, we challenged them to imagine how they could incorporate those principles into their work as well. Um, one of the things we've also realized is that um, in, in trying to figure out what a circularity future is for Toronto, um, we definitely made a lot of networks and contacts internationally, regionally, locally, nationally, um, to find out what other city journeys were. And what we found out was really that, um, you know, it's very bespoke to, to your region or to your context and what you're looking at. And, and circularity within a European context can look a lot different in a North American or a city context. So we've really started by creating almost like uh, a bit of a baselining um, understanding of what circularity is currently in the city of Toronto. So we just finished uh, a study called the baselining for a circular Toronto together with Circle Economy and the David Suzuki Foundation. And that baselining study really showed us what the current policy and social economic context was in the city. Um, it also mapped out a number of material flows that the city is consuming over time, uh, as well as gave us some future considerations that we're going to bring forward and to develop uh, our future roadmap for the city. So we're looking at developing a circular economy roadmap in the next couple of years, not only uh, with the city of Toronto, but with in partnership with other communities uh, within the city and outside of the city, because we realize that uh, as a city, we can't do that alone. We're going to have to bring in other regional partners within the greater Toronto area in order to achieve circularity as because the materials that we are consuming are not necessarily um, being locally managed. Our impact uh, has a lot of impact on other neighboring communities. Thanks, Annette. That was really great to hear. Um, and Jason, coming to you then, what's the future vision for a circular economy in Cleveland? Sure. Um, so I think we bring a little different perspective to, to my counterparts on this panel and that we're really at the beginning of our journey to formalize our circular economy in Cleveland. Um, you know, I, I think to understand kind of where we want to go from a vision standpoint, um, we've got to think a little bit about the context of Cleveland itself. If you're not familiar with us, we're a mid-sized city that's kind of at the center of a fairly large region. And as an older and industrialized city, we face some unique um, economic, environmental, and social challenges that we have to count for in all of the activity that we undertake out of our office. And we've really been working for about a decade or so to become a more sustainable economy. But I think to this point, the efforts directly around circularity had been somewhat ad hoc until about a year and a half ago. Um, it wasn't because we didn't think that circularity was important, but instead, you know, we really had some other priorities that we were focused on. Um, but I think like a lot of places, the last year really kind of helped us understand that we need to expedite and pick up the momentum a little bit to make the transition to a more circular economy. Um, I think like everybody around the world, we saw what COVID-19 has done from disrupting our, our local supply chains and upending how we think about things and how we look at things. Um, and really kind of taking that as an opportunity to step back and say, what is our opportunity to rethink our local economic model? And how do we put more focus on kind of an environmentally just and equitable economic recovery? I think at the same time, we were really dealing um, in the United States with some very real reckoning that we had to do around um, uh, racism and, and inequity and disparity and how that is fed into by some of our economic systems. And how do we use sustainable principles and circularity to kind of address that and bring that forward? And on a very hyper-local context, 
we also experienced a pretty serious breakdown in our broader waste management process. And we had to step back and reset and ultimately rebuild that whole system and operation. I think any one of those things in isolation would have been enough to spur us to take a little bit more intentional action on this. Um, but all three of them combined really elevated the need for us to prioritize this. So we started our Circular Cleveland initiative less than a year ago um, as a major initiative to really rethink waste management, reshape our local economy to be more equitable, and really to link some of the broader circular projects and programs that are already underway around clean energy and freshwater management and food development and distribution and natural systems. Um, like I said, we're at the beginning of this process, so we're really kind of building out what that roadmap is going to look like engaging with a lot of really good and strong partners, including our friends at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, um, to really help us kind of think about what this is going to look like and shape and really learn from communities. You know, we're not, we didn't reinvent the wheel here. So we're following a lot of the best practices and principles that other communities are doing and trying to find ways to take what's good, what works in other places and bring them to our local community and our local context in a way that's meaningful and impactful and really aligns with some of our local community priorities. Um, already. So you'll see and hear a lot of discussion from us about the economic benefits of this, um, the environmental benefits, but a lot of workforce and job creation potential that we see in Cleveland to help us solve some of our unique challenges. Great. Thanks, Gavin. If I were to just reflect quickly on the three city responses, I'd say that you've all mentioned something about having a vision to set the direction of travel, both internally for the city administration, but also externally um, for the private sector, civil society, um, and other key stakeholders for a circular economy transition. But really as well that you see the circular economy as a framework to meet economic, environmental, and social objectives um, for your city. And I think that's, that's really Really exciting and certainly what really excites me about the circular economy in cities. We're going to go to Q&A from the audience shortly, but I'd like us to just spend a little bit more time exploring your circular economy journeys. Um, and first, I'd like to talk about building early success. And maybe, Annette, if we come to you first, um, because we know that Toronto has been building on success for some time now, I wonder if you could share with us what you think has been critical to the early success of the circular economy transition in Toronto. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I think our early success, again, um, going back to my opening, is that really, um, embedding and creating and, uh, and uh, defining the resources required to actually work on a circular economy directly was was critical. So forming that circular economy and innovation group gave us the space for that dedicated thought power to go into that. And, and also um, building that community of practice within the city. So right now we have about 11 city divisions that are part of our internal cross-divisional circular economy working groups. So we meet with them regularly um, and get their input, um, not only on major studies that we're undertaking, uh, such as the baselining study that we just completed, knowing that um, although the circular economy unit was placed within solid waste management services in terms of the, in the administration within the city, in order for us to achieve circularity, it was going to really require that action throughout, um, permeating throughout uh, the divisions in the city. We've also worked on uh, engaging with the public through the creation of a circular economy external working group that consists of around 40 different um, organizations and representatives cross-disciplinary and again they've had the ability to um, engage with the city and provide feedback on certain major studies as well and we continue to engage with them to know um, how we can kind of support uh, externally uh, industry and businesses in the city as well to achieve circularity so that has really been um, what I would say one of the most major successes is to really take the time to uh, have that silo busting power, which I'll credit to one of my colleagues, Megan Davis, uh, has been really successful um, in, in really making an impact in circular, circular in Toronto. Great, thanks, Annette. Um, and then Gavin, coming to you in Glasgow, what would you share as some of the defining factors for early success in the city? Um, I think the, business-led approach that we took to begin with, um, carried out by our partner of the Chamber of Commerce, certainly helped raise awareness of the circular economy as a concept um, and, a, and a valuable theory that could really begin to have an impact from a, a sustainability point of view in the city. Um, once that had been manifest as, as successful, then we started to build upon that foundational work and really expand upon it and taking the concepts of 
changing industrial processes and combine it with our social justice programme. So when you, you hear a lot from Glasgow, you hear about the just transition. And that's really a key principle to the work that Glasgow is doing in terms of making sure that any transition we make, whether it be from a non-circular to a circular city or from an unsustainable to a sustainable position, that we ensure that all citizens are taken with us on that journey, regardless of their economic background um, or, or any other situation, that, that they benefit from these um, enhancements that we put in our place. And you know that's really laid out in the, the city's charter. Um, and that allowed us to really look at all aspects of sustainability and how this would help us to focus not just on um, economic um, benefits, but also the stewardship of the environment and our social impact too. I think it's um, it's also worth pointing out that we benefit from political cross-party support on this, and that's been very critical. The, the, the city um, announced the state of, of, of climate and ecological emergency in 2019. And since then, we have been moving at a frightening pace to try and really put action um, in place to start to work on, on uh, treating both of these emergencies. And the circular economy has a huge part to play in that. Um, and I, you know that aligned to the partnerships that we've developed, um, both internally within the council, externally um, with other partners, um, but also across Scotland, has really helped to kind of cement that as being one of the key principles um, in terms of our vision of what Glasgow of the future will look like. Brilliant. Thanks, Gavin. I think there's a lot there about a just transition that Jason and Cleveland can identify with. Um, so, Jason, coming to you, I know you've said that Cleveland is more at the start of its circular economy journey compared to Toronto and Glasgow. But I wondered if there's anything that you'd like to add about building early success. Yeah, I think for us, if, if I had to sum up kind of one of the keys and what's critical to success is collaboration. Um, I mentioned up top in my, my introduction that cities are often these innovation laboratories, and that really takes a lot of support from multiple partners. And in our experience in Cleveland, we found that as a municipal government, if we're going to get anything done, um, both from a sustainability standpoint or from a larger policy perspective, we have to do it in collaboration with private and, and, and nonprofit partners. I mean, the challenges that we face as a city and some of those unique economic challenges that I mentioned um, very briefly um, and the resources that are required to solve those are just so large that it's really too big for any institutional actor, whether it's government or corporate or nonprofit, to solve on their own. So we've tried to apply that approach as we build out our climate action plan, our clean energy transition work, our tree canopy work, on and on and on. Um, and it, we've had success with this, right? And we want to take that principle. We've started replicating that with our circular economy program. Uh, we've got a lot of great partners. Um, you know, Ellen MacArthur obviously came in and helped bring that international perspective. We're really working to link some of our local process through community engagement. Um, so we just launched our community engagement. We've got over 100 people attend our engagement sessions already, which is a large number for us, right? This has our government partners, our corporate communities. We have our Fortune 500 companies at the table, nonprofits. And I think most importantly, from our perspective, residents as well. So we're making that connection so that it's not just a, a, a top-down, here's the solution. We've, we figured out how to solve this for you, but really engaging people so that we can build some long-term trust and make this um, make this a little bit more of an effective process long-term for, for everybody and a little bit more successful. Brilliant. Thanks, Jason. I think those three perspectives from the cities have been a really good story and have provided really great examples about how you build the foundational enabling environment for circular economy in the city. But now I want to turn to concrete actions um, that each of your cities are taken. So let's maybe first let's let's go back to you jason and maybe ask you if you could share with us one key intervention action or principle that the city of cleveland is taking that's really central to your approach to advance the circular economy so i'll go with a principle that we're going to turn into interventions and actions as we work through this and, and we have been very intentional about putting a focus on equity um I mentioned in my opening remarks that we face some unique economic and environmental and social challenges. And I think probably at the top of that list, specific to Cleveland, is poverty. We have a very high level of poverty in our city and then income and inequality within our region. And that can be linked to all of the historical inequities, disparities, and racism that we know exist, right? So 
Our most recent census estimates show that about a third of the city's population live in poverty. Nationally, that number is 10%. When we look at children, that number jumps to about half. And these disparities aren't limited to income, right? We see them manifest themselves across all the social determinants of health and other kind of different measures of environmental exposure and those things. And we know that those impacts of climate change are disproportionately felt by our low income communities of color. So with that in mind, and this comes straight from Mayor Jackson, who's my boss, and he has been very direct with us that we have to find ways to use climate action to address these things. We just cannot fail on this. So we started with our climate action plan in 2018. We built a racial equity toolkit that we use to evaluate every single thing we do from this. And if it doesn't kind of pass that check, we either send it back to the drawing board or we de deprioritize it. So whenever we talk about a project, it's going to have some direct connection to equity for us. And, you know, we've looked at our clean energy plan, for example, and that's focused on energy burden and workforce development and economic job opportunities. Using our tree canopy and our tree investments and targeting those a little bit more smart um, to solve for some of our air quality and our health disparity challenges that we know. That those good. And our circular economy plan is going to have a similar focus to that. We were very intentional as we set up our project planning to put um, a really important aspect of the project focused on the economic benefits and in particular job and wealth creation. So we know that there's a lot of circular activity happening in Cleveland, for example. And we want to honor that and respect that. We may not call it circular, but there are a lot of folks who are doing this out of necessity in our neighborhoods just to help control their costs and get things done. And what we want to do with our project is include funding to help us bring that to scale. So we built micro grants into our projects. We have micro grants that will target to residents and neighborhood level groups who can say, okay, you're already doing this work. You're already fixing machines or equipments for your neighbors. Let's give you a little bit of seed fine to help you scale that up so that it can become an economic opportunity. It can become a path to employment. It can become a way that you to uh, support yourself and your family and really keeping that intentional focus on the economic benefits and ensuring that everybody has the opportunity to benefit from this. Um, a lot of times, everything we do has a benefit and a cost. We need to make sure that those costs and benefits line up to protect and benefit everyone. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. I think that's a really interesting people-centric, equitable approach to implementing circular economy. Um, Annette, what is something that you would share from Toronto's perspective about uh, your central kind of principle or action um, or intervention that you've been focusing on? Uh, the example that I wanted to provide is uh, one that's helped the city not only work towards meeting our waste reduction uh, initiatives, but also and, and waste diversion goals, but also one that allows the city to reduce uh, emissions across the organization through long term investment in organics waste diversion. So what you hear, you see here on the screen is a, a, a kind of a pictorial of how our, our intervention works. So we have one of the most uh, diverse and, and largest organic uh, waste collection programs, I think, for a city in North America. We collect waste from our single family homes as well as some small commercial businesses. Uh, when that waste is collected, we've uh, invested in infrastructure called an anaerobic digestion uh, to process the organic waste within city boundaries. So that minimizes the need for transport outside the city. Um, and also uh, the anaerobic digestion has less, um, uh, I guess, uh, impacts to the surroundings in terms of odors and things like that. So again, that's why it, you can process it within the city limits. Um, and we've actually developed a process uh, together with Enbridge Gas to uh, harness uh, the biogas that's created through anaerobic digestion, upgrade the biogas, and it can now be injected into our natural gas grid. Um, and then that can be then used to offset the fuel for our compressed natural gas vehicles that actually collect the organic waste, reducing our uh, reliance on fossil fuels. And also we've uh, looked at using that natural gas or that biogas to offset the city's natural gas needs as it relates to heating and cooling in, in other city operations as well. So we're, allowed, we're able to meet some of our city climate action goals as well as our waste diversion goals. And also the regenerative aspect to this uh, this program as well is that the digestate or the, the materials that are digested from that organic waste can actually also be made into compost, which can then be put on to the soil to, to regenerate soil. So this is one uh, example that I wanted to provide because it has allowed for, again, that, that local city processing 
it demonstrates value to our residents within the city. It demonstrates um, our uh, basically our, our intentional move away uh, from relying on fossil fuels, as well as um, you know really having residents be able to participate in that program actively as well. Thanks, Annette. I think that's a really great concrete action that other local governments could think about replicating or adapting to their context. Gavin, coming to you now, what would you share from Glasgow? Um, I think perhaps we'll share one that's maybe not quite as visible, but certainly has a potentially profound effect on the city. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about procurement, ultimately. The, the public pound, um, or dollar, or whichever currency is, is most accurate, um, is one of the greatest tools we have at hand to help shape the way in which Glasgow and cities can influence their own economy. Um, by defining the manner in which external organisations can access the supplier lists that we have, can have a significant impact on the types of companies and the types of activities that can enhance the circular economy. We are currently revising all of our own corporate procurement sustainability tests within Glasgow City Council to ensure that elements of circularity are included throughout the entire process from tender to project delivery, whichever project that might be. Our procurement teams, our procurement officers are undergoing specific training um, and the entire process will ensure that certain parameters are satisfied to ensure compliance. So this is really about embedding practice, embedding capacity into council processes so that circularity becomes the norm. It becomes the way that we do these things. That training will also ensure that the skills learned are transferable across multiple sectors. So obviously, the city's procurement department are involved in massive projects and have the ability to then uh, influence other procurement teams and the way that businesses operate in terms of winning tenders by having circular practices embedded within their, their service delivery. We also recognise that the officers producing the tender documents, they require a degree of ownership of the sustainability and circularity agendas as well, because it's not just our procurement departments that do that, they're working on behalf of other departments within the, the city um, as clients. So by doing that, we can build that capacity within all of the different departments in the, the, the city from education and social work and neighbourhoods and sustainability, all of them having circularity and sustainability embedded in how they work. And that creates a much greater awareness and adherence. Further to this, we intend to embed post-contract assessments as well. So quite often, contracts in the past may have said, to have some kind of community benefit, but then no real um, pursuit of what that community benefit is or whether that was actually delivered. So having those post-contract assessments allows us to ensure that the tests have been appropriate, that the contracts were awarded and that they are circular and that they have delivered um, the circularity that they, they intended as per the tender document. Um, and that will also give us metrics, which is something the circular economy lacks when compared to other economies um, and other uh, processes as metrics. So it gives us a chance to really show that we have made progress in terms of circularity and that that circularity has had an impact and benefits. Thanks for that, Gavin. I know that Toronto has certainly also has a really interesting circular public procurement journey. That's also something that Cleveland is looking into. I feel like we've been having a chat amongst ourselves for quite some time now. And I'm wondering, Vanessa, if we take a question from the audience, perhaps before I go back to, to one of my questions. What do you think? Great. That's a great idea, Sarah. We've got lots of great questions here. And also, I just want to note, Annette, Gavin, and um, Jason, when you, after this, there's some specific questions for each of you that you could go into the chat and, and into question, answer, and answer. Uh, just to say also that if you'd like a copy of the chat, just um, there's an email address in the question and answer to get that if you're not able to download it. Um, so what I'm going to do is, of course, we won't get to every question, but I'll prioritize it based on the thumbs up or thumbs up that you can do within the question and answer. So, Sarah, the number one question is how what have people learned, the panelists learned about circular circular economy in non urban centers? Interesting. So Annette, Gavin or Jason, 
something that you've learned from outside of the city context and maybe that you're bringing into the city context in terms of implementing circular economy. Any one of you want to give it a go? <laughs> yeah, I will. I'll start. Uh, I think one of the things that I've learned uh, through my my uh, journey here is that uh, the value of um, in informalized actions uh, that still help to achieve circularity. So often, I think you know, as a city administrator, I, I think about programs and policies and and things like that that I can do to create the the programs and the services. But there's actually a strong value in what uh, individuals and groups of individuals or communities can do on their own, whether that be, um, you know, taking up uh, smaller scale actions uh, to collect materials that currently don't fall into our larger structure and testing and trialing out um, some of those innovative solutions outside of something that we would call scaled up and, you know, whether or not the city would take it as a whole. So to me, um, it, it, we should not ignore those types of actions. And, and uh, one of my, my stickers always is that, uh, I, you know, I, I understand we want the scale for impact, but I don't think that scale should ever um, leave behind the smaller actions that can eventually, you know, have, have greater outcomes. So that for me has been a learning from smaller uh, communities outside of larger cities. Annette, just a question directly to that. Uh, Sarah Legg was asking about those kind of informal actions, communities realizing uh, circular practice in microgroups in the cities. So for example, in Toronto, there's community refrigerators, but they run into a lot of barriers in terms of bylaws that don't allow that adaptive innovation. So could you speak to that when you're doing that informal work, how the city might um, perhaps relax a bylaw in order to ha help that happen? Um, I, I think, uh, you know, we encourage um, residents and community members that are taking those actions to engage with the city to to see where we can help. In some cases, um, you know, it might be areas or jurisdictions where we don't have the authority to change certain things. It might be a different order of government that might be regulating something. But I would just say encouraging the conversation to see uh, if, if there's another way that we can still get the same outcome that doesn't have kind of come up against the same kind of barrier. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you. So there's a, uh, uh, Sarah, if it's all right, there's a really big question around yep. measurement. Does that, should we go to that one now? Um, yeah, yeah, we can do that. So, yeah. Go so there's it. a question about how cities measure circularity and judge progress. Is it waste management targets or are there other indicators? And connected to that, Alice uh, Henry was just asking about not just measuring what happens within the context of your city, but also these scope three emissions. So are you measuring things that are actually happening outside of your city, um, targets that are about um, the import of reducing production emissions, for example, through uh, urban consumption? Uh, and that's just a note is connected to Sarah Legg's question around how um, circular economy in these capitalist core cities are impacting or benefiting people who are producing goods and being imported into cities. So the specific question is really about um, the measurement of circular economy, but perhaps some of you have uh, targets that are also about scope three or about that producer imported uh, consumption indicators. Yeah, maybe Gavin, maybe you have a, an answer for this and then we can come back to Jason and Annette. Um, I, I think, so I made the point previously, um, metrics are something that are lacking in the circular economy. We tend to measure progress on emissions. Um, so how the circular economy is playing into the global or the city-wide emissions picture, if you like. Um, but we have begun to bring in different initiatives that are generating information. So we do have our Sustainable Glasgow Partnership. Um, and part of something that we've built there is the Sustainable Glasgow Charter, which um, has built businesses signing up to that. And by signing up to it, committing to certain practices, circularity being one of them, that gives us much more insight into the work they're doing. So while we can see the overall emissions picture, um, we can begin to see the action that they're taking and we can work with them year on year. So we we can then begin to look at the work that they're doing internally in the city, but also the supply chains as well. And through our partnerships, um, the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance being one of them, we are looking at various different potential technologies to help with that and to help with approaches. We have 
colleagues in Copenhagen which are doing some interesting stuff on scope three emissions. Um, we are also working with startup businesses that are looking to catalogue materials in the city and allow those materials to be traded in the city um, and also if effectively tracked. So we can see the volume of materials that are being made available and then being reused. And, and all of that information enhances our understanding of, of the success that we are having. Ultimately, I think it would be disingenuous to say we have a, you know, a real clear understanding of the, the situation. And, and the more information we get, the more metrics we have, the better that will be. Um, and I think ultimately we're at the start of that journey. But all of that information, once it's aggregated and brought together, it enhances our intelligence. We store it and share it in the right ways. That helps to enhance the, the, the practices of, of businesses and citizens across the city and ultimately progresses us on that path. But I think we're still not as close as we'd like to be in having that that metric that we can say this is good or bad. Yeah, thanks for that, Gavin. Uh, Vanessa, do we have time to for Annette or Jason to add to that, or do we need to move on? I think it would be great because measurement is always so critical. I don't know Annette or Jason if you don't want to. I see Jason, you've unmuted yourself. Go ahead. So I think I, I would just reiterate to a certain extent Gavin's yeah, point is that. There's still a lot of work to be done here. And this, this is painful. I'm a statistician by training, so I love measurement. I love metrics. And trying to figure out how to quantify success and what that long-term path forward looks like is a challenge that I think we all need to, to figure out together and try to get a little bit better with. From an emissions management standpoint, I think we're going to have to figure out how to tackle that scope three question a little bit more directly, because in a city like Cleveland, we don't see huge localized waste emissions. That's just not what our emissions profile looks like. We've got some odd, unique externalities. It makes up a very small piece of the pie. So without being able to capture that bigger picture, um, I think we're going to miss the real impact. But measurement is critically important for a whole bunch of reasons from a project success and maintaining buy-in and doing all those things. But I I couldn't agree more with what Gavin said. I think we've got some work to do there. Great. Um, one of the questions that's coming up is just around, um, uh, Meg O'Shea was mentioning around uh, that most of the programs here are focused on waste treatment options. And so wondering whether or not uh, the cities are working on reducing waste and design for circularity from sources across multiple industries. So, and, um, and then I'll come to you, Gavin, with a particular question around the review of waste incineration. But maybe, Annette, do you want to speak about whether or not there's beyond waste initiatives happening in Toronto that are focused on other sectors? Yeah, for sure. Uh, another, uh, I guess, example I'll, I'll provide that uh, isn't quite directly associated with waste, with waste um, because it was actually... Um, uh, an installation of parkettes that we worked with uh, our parks department and transportation services. So they had uh, art design uh, competitions where they would uh, seek out artists to create um, public spaces. And, and typically in the past, um, I guess there's a tidal waste in the sense that once those installations had had served their kind of contract period, then those materials would then, you know, just be taken away. So while it wasn't necessarily a waste management issue, we worked with another division to ensure that the design of those uh, parquettes were designed in such a way that it incorporated circularity principles. So making sure that um, after their their installation period was over, um, they could either be redistributed and reused, uh, uh, their materials could be used within the community or they could be donated and continue to be used. So some of the examples that we got that were pretty innovative um, were things like wheelbarrows that grew um, uh, food and beans and, and, and uh, food within the community. Another one was, uh, equipment that could be used at a school afterwards. So I think that there's ways that doesn't necessarily focus on a waste issue, but it looks at other elements of what the city services or city activations may bring and kind of start challenging our other departments to kind of also seek um, opportunities for circularity principles to be incorporated. Great. Thanks, Annette. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to you, Sarah, for a final question. Just wanted to note, Annette, that what you were mentioning around looking at it through the lens of parks and nature was another one of the questions. We also, of course, heard the leadership from Indigenous communities um, and the way in which they've actually been designing for circularity. It's where many of our principles come from. And Joanne will be speaking a bit more to that in a moment. 
and also the role of women in the informal economy that has often been overlooked in our larger economies, um, you know, where a lot of the work is already happening. So just wanted to note some of these other points coming in to the question and answer. And uh, Gavin, I won't be asking you the question directly, but there are direct questions to Gavin, Jason, and Annette in the question and answer. So you have a chance, go in there afterwards. And back to you, Sarah. Thanks for all the questions from the participants. Yeah, thanks everyone. Really interesting questions. I know that Glasgow, Cleveland and Toronto all have some really great stories that are published um, on the internet. So there definitely will be links that are being shared that I'd encourage you uh, to have a look at afterwards. Um, not during the session because we're having a very interesting conversation. Um, I guess my my last question uh, to Gavin, Annette and Jason would be around building buy-in and embedding the circular economy across the city administration. And I know we've, we've touched on this a little bit, but I'd really like to ask you to kind of focus a little bit in on like the how, like how did you how have you embedded circular economy in the city administration? Um, Gavin, you've given us an example already about public procurement. So maybe, Annette, if I, if I come to you first about how you've been building buy-in internally and externally, but really focusing in on the how, the how you've done that. Sure. So uh, similar to Gavin, um, we've also developed a circular economy procurement framework. So we're exploring ways to use the city's buying power to influence the circularity of the city, but also more of a, a deeper, more nitty gritty um, requirement for us in order to enter into some uh, agreements or contracts. We need the ability to be agile and in an uh, administration like a city, you often re require certain authorities to do those types of things. So whether it be, um, you know, for, you know, join a, an organization or a contract agreement of some kind. So, for example, recently, the City of Toronto joined the Canadian Plastics Pact. So we needed authority from the city to do that. So one of the ways that we made it a little bit simpler and kind of socialized that within a city context is actually we, we, we engaged with our political layer and we asked for authority to directly enter into contracts and agreements. Uh, at, at the city's sole discretion that supported circularity. So I think that while it's a little bit bureaucratic in nature, um, if, if we had to look at that independently as each one of those opportunities came up, then sometimes you can kind of miss those opportunities. So that was definitely something that um, we looked at uh, in, in order to kind of facilitate um, the ability to be a little bit more agile and respond to those opportunities as they come up. Thanks, Annette. Jason, something from Cleveland? Yeah, so I think, you know, we're, like I said, we're kind of at the beginning of the process. And, you know, we hear a lot from our, our it's very easy for us to get the right people to the table. We've demonstrated some success in other areas. Getting people to the table is, is fairly simple. Keeping them at the table and engaged is where we have, uh, not just Cleveland, I think just generally you, we have challenges doing that. And that's true with our internal partners, right? So everybody kind of agrees with circularity as a concept. Um, but what we really have to focus on doing is, is how do we put it into practice, right? And I think for us, that's communication and transparency with those internal stakeholders. We want to keep them active. We want to keep them engaged. We want to keep them pulling in the same direction because that's really the only way that big systemic change is going to occur, like changing your procurement system or changing you know, an operation in city government. You know, we always kind of fall back on this metaphor that kind of changing government processes is kind of like turning a cruise ship around. It takes time. I don't know that that's actually an apt metaphor, right? Because cruise ships are designed to turn. Like systems aren't necessarily that way. There's a lot of entropy built in and baked into these systems. And to overcome that, you've got to have time. You've got to be able to get people on board. Um, measurement, I think, is key. And being able to demonstrate success and, and pointing to some easy, quick wins. So our micro-grant programs, we're launching a composting program at our 100-year-old publicly owned market kind of the dedicated small business loans that we're kind of putting in place through this, but getting people on board and understanding that that success is, and also being very clear that not all of this is going to work, right? We're going to try things that are going to fail. So let's celebrate the success, let's learn from the failure, because that's an important part of this process as we make these big systemic changes. That's hard. That's hard to kind of get people on board with. So it just takes that continual communication and engagement. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. I want to give you, Gavin, 30 seconds, one minute to kind of add your two cents to this conversation, and then we're going to have to wrap up and move on. Um, yeah, well, very quickly, I just 
I loved what Jason had to say there. I think that that tells the story of Glasgow. We started this journey in 2010 with the Sustainable Glasgow Partnership. And, and as Jason says, bringing the people to the table was not a problem. Keeping at the table and keeping them engaged has been, for a decade plus, has been, has been a huge challenge. And we've had to continually flex and, and refresh that partnership. Um, and we've achieved so much. We, you know, we smashed our carbon target for 2020. Um, we had a 30% target. We're already at 42% um, by 2019. So, you know, doing really well. But still, we have to keep that message fresh. And I think if you talk to any kind of communication expert, getting systems, not only systems, but people to make change is something that comes by constant reinforcement because people will resort to habit. And it's the same with businesses. It's the same with systems. So, well, we've had great success in building things and showing, you know, new projects. We're still having to fight hard to keep those systemic changes in place. Um, as it becomes more challenging and less convenient and more difficult, and it's the strength of those partnerships that really help to do that. So in that time frame, um, sustainability has become much more mainstream. Circularity is becoming rapidly more part of the, the conversation in, in many ways through localism and post-pandemic. People want to be able to, to have everything within reach and, and not be isolated anymore. Um, so I think the momentum is really good. And the work that we've put in in the run-up to now has given us a really solid position to launch from and keep that almost exponential increase in activity um, going. Um, at some point, that exponential increase has to kind of get a bit more gentle. I don't have much more hair to lose, as you can see, but um, you know we'll get there and it'll become mainstream. And I think it's, it's that early work embedding it in there um, and continually to work with partners and get that message out there and reinforce that message with action and good communication that really embeds change. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin, Annette and Jason. That was a really, really interesting discussion. There's so much happening in your cities and not enough time to discuss it. And I think we ended on a really great note about storytelling and, and communicating successes um, and learning from the failures. So with that, I will hand back to you, Vanessa. Um, no, I won't, because we're not going to do Q&A. We've done that. Um, we are going to move from this very kind of local level discussion to focusing in on how different actors, different organizations can help to support accelerating the circular economy in cities and regions. And so we will come to a discussion with our colleagues in the Netherlands about regions and national policies and how they can enable um, create an enabling environment for the circular economy. But, but let's focus in on some two organizations, specifically the OECD and the Canadian Circular Cities and Regions Initiative, um, and how they are supporting the acceleration of the circular economy in cities and regions. So we're going to come to our audience again and ask you to share some ideas with us. We're going to ask you to answer the following question in the chat, and we'll ask our speakers to, to reflect on your, on your comments and feedback. So the question is, what innovative strategies or place-based approaches have you had success with or do you see as critical to scaling the circular economy transition in cities and regions globally. So we'll let you type your answers and, and we'll come back to them in a moment. Um, I, I first want to talk to Joanne about the Circular Cities and Regions Initiative in Canada, because it's a new pilot initiative that aims to build circular economy knowledge and capacity in Canada. Um, and it's really, really exciting. So Joanne, I've been really excited to see this program unfold. I think it's a really interesting initiative that uses kind of a one-to-many approach to accelerate the circular economy. Could you talk to us about what the initiative is and what it aims to achieve? That's great, Sarah. Thank you very much. And I've never heard that phrase before, one-to-many. <laughs> I think that that really sums it up. So uh, just to give you a little bit of background on the Circular Cities and Regions Initiative, uh, we're really excited by this project. Um, it is a very unique national collaboration of four partner organizations, um, and it's being delivered as a one-year pilot that builds on a very successful approach that was originally pioneered through the Recycling Council of Alberta Circular Cities Project. So again, that's just one additional resource and reference for people to go to. 
Um, I think our goal with the project overall is really to enable local governments to think through how circular economy can help them deliver on their social, environmental and um, economic objectives, to provide some direct support to them in their own internal process, and to really host a national conversation on best practices and approaches. And this is one of those sessions. Um, it's been pointed out in the chat, rightly so, that we need more Indigenous perspectives also in this conversation. And we do need a much bigger and broader conversation overall. So we'll certainly look at that within the context of the CCRI and future sessions. I think a really exciting piece of the program that I would draw your attention to is the peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, so through this process, we're working with a group of 15 communities, a very diverse group of cities and regions from across the country. They're getting direct one-on-one -on -one support from the team, as well as a, a host of advisors, including EMF. Um, they're meeting monthly to talk about common challenges and opportunities. And over the course of the next six months, they will be going through very much an opportunity identification process to help them map strategic opportunities so that they can take the next steps in their journey. Um, you can see them on the slide. They're a very diverse group. Um, they each have their own unique context and are at different stages of readiness. So they're, they're doing some deep thinking on this topic. I know many of them are on the call today uh, and we look forward to seeing how they progress. So Joanne, I recognize that it's very early on um, in the initiative um, and the program's evolution, but I wonder if you could share with us some early insights that seem to be emerging through the program and speak a little bit about the leadership that you see emerging in cities and regions in Canada through the initiative. Yes, so we did just launch in March, so it is early days, but um, in terms of observations, I think the first would really be just getting a better understanding of the leadership and activity that's already underway in Canada. So it's great to have Annette here. Um, there's lots to learn from the approach that's being embraced at Toronto. There's also significant leadership happening in some of our other metropolitan regions like Vancouver and Montreal. Um, you may have seen Guelph Wellington earlier in the session um, a few days ago. They're developing Canada's first circular food economy. And we have other interesting examples like the town of Banff, um, which is a resort town in the Canadian Rockies, and they're really developing a response in the context of tourism. So I think that gives you a flavor of what's happening. Um, what I would suggest and what's I think already come up is local governments have been developing progressive policies for many years. So this isn't about a net new initiative for many local governments. It's They might not have a formal circular economy strategy in place, but there's lots of activity that's happening to address climate and economic development and advance zero waste in the context of a circular economy. I think we're also seeing local governments, and this has come up as well, really embracing that role of being enablers and facilitators of the circular economy in their cities and regions. Um, so I think one of the first steps for many of the communities that we've been talking to is to really take stock of what they already have underway and understand what their unique circular economy story or context is. And from the context of the program overall, we're really curious over the course of the next six to eight months to understand better how we can take some of those innovative approaches in global cities and apply them in different contexts and jurisdictions moving forward. And I think the final thing that I would draw attention to um, that we've seen as a real success factor early on is really that role of peer-to-peer -peer exchange. So that ability to talk to other local governments and they can be in very different contexts to yourself um, pardon me, and to talk not just about the challenges and the opportunities, but also the less tangible pieces, like how you build um, and embed circularity across the organization. I loved Annette saying silo busters. Um, this is really, you know, tricky stuff to navigate, and it's really great to be able to connect with others and hear their ideas for moving forward. Thanks, John. We need to move on to Ariana and the OECD, but I'm going to give you 30 seconds to reflect on some of what you're seeing coming through in the chat um, and any kind of key takeaways or reflections that you're seeing from the chat, and then we're going to move on. 
Yeah, great suggestions in the chat. I think, you know, this notion of an innovation lens um, and programs and thinking differently about innovation and not just business innovation, but I think policy innovation is really important and a, a really important part of the conversation for local governments moving forward. It's really important that we see both the private sector and the public sector working together towards the circular economy vision. So now, now coming to you, Ariana, um, I think it would be really great if we can hear from you about the work that the OECD is doing in cities and regions and what they can do to get started. And we know that the OECD has been supporting cities and regions to accelerate their transition to a circular economy for some time now, and that you've recently come out with this amazing synthesis report that outlines framework and guidance specifically for cities and regions. Could you talk to us briefly about the findings in that report and particularly the three P's framework um, mm -hmm. as part of it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, and everybody for the opportunity to contribute to this very interesting discussion and for the inspiring speeches so far. Uh, well, yes, as the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, as uh, uh, many of you know, but uh, many others may not be familiar with this organization. Basically, we work with governments at different levels, so national, regional, and local governments to support them with their transition towards a circular economy. Uh, this is not an easy endeavor for uh, cities that are, let's say, starting the transition and get to have a better understanding of what the circular economy actually is and what does it imply and what the opportunities, the benefit, the cost are. Um, and so what we, we do basically is uh, three things. The first uh, we support them by providing guidance, so looking at the economic characteristics of a city or a region. It's really to find out the opportunities for the circular economy to take place. And we provide some place-based solutions in accordance to uh, dialogue, a dialogue that we have with several stakeholders that are involved in our process. Uh, in fact, I mean, we start by the, the thing that circular economy is a shared responsibility. So the first P of this 3P approach is people. The second piece, policy, is policy. And one of the, the other thing that we do is to look at uh, the various uh, policies that are involved in a circular economy as a system. So it is important for us uh, to have a holistic view and go beyond just uh, waste and, you know, using the circular economy as a synonym of recycling. Uh, it's much more than that, and this implies innovation this is this kind of innovation we are talking about also from an institutional and social perspective uh, we do this also through as uh, joan mentioned city to city learning we have a platform that is called um, roundtable on the circular economy in cities and regions but being an organization that is represented by national government is also important to put national and local government in dialogue as a even though cities are at the center of the transition, cannot do everything on their own. Our city representative mentioned, for example, the importance of regulations, and sometimes it's really a responsibility of the national government. So this dialogue is fundamental. And the third uh, piece of the framework is places, in the sense that uh, uh, cities are not just uh, isolated ecosystem. It's important to create synergies uh, with the rural areas, so for example, making sure that there are connection and there is an economic of functionality at the right scale. So, for example, uh, um, initiatives in relation to industrial symbiosis have to be taken into account at the right scale. There are some uh, uh, loops that can be closed at regional scale. So, uh, all these uh, functionalities in terms of places have also to be taken into account, and this is what we do when we work with cities, the local government, national government, analyzing this structure, this framework of people, policies, and places. Great, thanks. We are very quickly running out of time. Um, 
I, I also just want to note that in the report, and Joanne has also said this, that you, you say that local governments can act as promoters, enablers and facilitators. Could you quickly just explain to us a little bit about what that means? Very quickly, uh, with in this uh, synthesis report in which we worked with more than 50 cities all around the world and many case studies in uh, uh, Spain, the Netherlands, Sweden, uh, Ireland, uh, the UK, we are working also with the city of Glasgow. Uh, we found out that uh, cities can take the role as a promoters in order to promote a cultural uh, shift towards a circular economy, facilitators, because collaboration is a fundamental with the private, the public, and for private sector, and enablers because of all the governance conditions that should be in place to make sure that there is a, a fundamental change that can be mainstreamed in the economy and cannot just represent an exception or an experimentation. So you need regulation, financing, capacity building, support for innovation, data, and monitoring framework. Great, thanks. I think that's a really, in, like, really interesting and useful point for us to remember that it's not always about regulation and legislation, but there are lots of other things that local governments can do to help accelerate the transition to a circular economy. So then quickly in 30 seconds, going back to all of our audience members who are actively engaging in the chat, um, Ariana, what would you say, based on the chat, um, kind of stands out for you? Are there any similarities or, or things that themes that have been coming up through your work as well? Well, from the chat, there are many inputs, but I think that it's important to, to probably uh, look at uh, how not only to start up, but how to scale up, so learn from success stories and also from uh, failures. It is important to map, so map stakeholders and map activities, map initiatives. It doesn't have to be a total, uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have to leverage what is existing already. We have to look at the upstream activities, not only the downstream activity, activities related to waste management, and I'm repeating myself, not only recycling, but also reducing waste at source, so eco-design, and make sure that we use the things as much as possible, and apply these principles in cities. So how? Looking at how cities are providing services to cities, and what kind of activities, economic activities, are taking place in the cities, and how to build similar across the infrastructure that are uh, um, part of our city life. That was a really, really great contribution. Thanks, Ariana. As I said, so much to discuss and so little time, but I'm really enjoying the diversity of examples and stories that we're hearing. Um, we're going to move from this local and regional level now to a national uh, and regional level conversation. Over to you, Vanessa. Thank you, Sarah. We gaan terug naar Nederland. We're going back to the Netherlands. So it's now my pleasure to welcome back the four speakers in the Dutch studio, Chessa, Cora, John, and Arnold. And I'm going to go uh, to each of you to talk about, um, about the very interesting example of collaboration and leadership in a province, in the provinces, and how you've engaged key stakeholders in the Netherlands. And you're really leading the way of the circular economy transition, which is really necessary because the Netherlands has set a bold and ambitious national target. It's a vision to make Netherlands fully circular by 2050. So to understand this provincial story better, I'll start with you, um, Tessa Stelbstra, and I'm going to ask you to talk about your work as the regional minister in Drenthe, and in particular about the opinion that you wrote on the Circular Economy Action Plan. Can you speak a bit about the main messages of regions or provinces discussed in that, uh, that report? Over to you, Tessa. Thank you. Let me start with I'm very proud to be a citizen and a regional minister in the Northern Netherlands. It's a region where we are working hand in hand together and go together to the circular economy, the circular society. And our strength is the, the transitional power in our region, I think. And therefore, you should be in the Northern Netherlands because it's a circular valley. But now to Europe. I wrote an opinion for the, on, the European, uh, on the circular action plan from the European Commission 
They launched it in 2020. And there is an European advisory body with elected representatives from all EU countries, the Committee of Regions, and they give advices and meanings to the European Commission. And I had the pleasure to write an opinion on this circular economy action plan. It was in the time of COVID, and I made a lot of references to COVID, but we see how what COVID did with us, how dependent we are on resources, for instance. And that, that, that is, is a big um, a wake up for us that we have to do it in another way. So, but COVID learned us also other things, that we can make very, very quick changes. We, get, we, we, we did get in no time to a digital society, I think, to a digital world. So we can make big changes. So that's a very hopeful message for the circular economy, I think. Let me go to the opinion I wrote. And just a few remarks, because we have not, not, not very much time. And you can read it on the website of the committee. I did uh, give some advices to the, to, to the, committee, to the Commission of the, uh, to the European Commission um, by my opinion. And I will give you some examples. First, we have to change the paradigm, the paradigm on waste. We have to change to the paradigm there is no waste. That's very important to have that, that, that kind of paradigms because our citizens can understand it very easily. Another advice I gave, we have to create the obligation to use recycled materials. That's essential. Another message is we need targets. We need very strong targets and we need to measure them. And we have to do a lot in education from kindergarten to university, circular economy should be a very important point in the portfolio on education. Great, thank you, Tessa. So when you spoke at the beginning about why regions and cities are important, you said that they're, because we need to make the change of society as a whole, their connection to people. Do you have a couple other words you wanna say about why um, this circular, and circular cities and regions and provinces are important? because they have a lot of competence on with which with, with they can handle with. They have competences on waste, I, I, I mentioned it. They have competences on water. Uh, they have competences on the whole environment. And one of the speakers in the session before spoke about public procurement. It's a very big instrument we can use as regions and cities. And we are close to the citizens, so we can speak to the citizens and we can inspire them and involve them. Yes, and actually Tasha in the chat was mentioning that when we measure those dashboards, you know, we should really make sure we include that social sustainability and inclusion part because often it's very, the dashboards can be very, or progress measurement can be very uh, technical, but how do we make sure we bring those people in as you're mentioning? Can you tell me a little bit about how regions deal with the current challenges? How could a region make a transition towards a circular economy, a success? And yes, speak to us about Northern Holland and your experience there in that province. One important thing is that we have to collaborate. And I can give you an example. We have an iconic project in the Northern Netherlands, the Clean North. And here we work on a collaboration, on a strategy for the chemical clusters in a few cities in the Northern Netherlands. And we collaborate with the companies, but also with the knowledge sector, namely the University of the North. And they had a developed um, ecosystem that works to reduce the amount of virgin petroleum-based plastics that is used in the Northern Netherlands. And this led to the initiation of a project where, as I said, companies such as the recycling business, knowledge institutes, and governmental organizations work together. And it's creates jobs, it, it attract, attracts businesses, 175 businesses, small and, and large. It, it, it um, attracted 500 million of investment. It created, will create 5,000 jobs. So it is very important that we show these examples to our citizens so they can be inspired to get together with us and to our companies. I can't hear you anymore. 
Thank you. Uh, like, yes, I've got, somebody has got to not press uh, mute. Um, uh, I was going to say that that's a, a step towards that, a clean circular, a true circular valley that you're creating in the clean north. So thank you for that example, uh, Chessa. And let's move to you, Cora. So Cora Smelik is the regional minister for Flevoland. Um, can you tell me about a really interesting uh, uh, initiative you did, which is to create a power map, an opportunity map, what is a power map, Cora? Yes, thank you. It was very good to hear Ariana from the OECD also talk about we should be getting maps. So this is one example that we have made. Uh, we as combined provinces uh, have, see, have seen that if we want to have a fundamental change in, towards a circular economy uh, on all aspects, then we have to combine powers because you, you can't do it on your, own, on your own and it's not necessary to do it on your own. Uh, I think this power map where, where we uh, have plotted all the uh, best practices that we have in uh, different regions, provinces in the Netherlands uh, gives a good example of how we can inspire each other, how we can help each other, because not only we have uh, uh, made a map of what opportunities we see and uh, best practices we see, but it also made a map of uh, dilemmas and barriers that we have seen on the way towards the transition to uh, the implementation of a circular economy, and that results in an implementation program that we can make with this kickoff initiative to to uh, really deepen our collaboration uh, between the regions, the provinces in the Netherlands. And speaking of collaboration, can you speak a bit about that process of creating the map? What was that like? Yeah, well, it was very special. Uh, I can hear my colleague uh, Chester just speaking, and I can hear that he's really proud of his region, of his province, Drenthe, in the north of the Netherlands. And we have seen that uh, if you can inspire each other, and we can really, uh, we made a tour around all uh, of the provinces, we have talked uh, deeply and in, in intense dialogue about what are you doing, what are your challenges, what what are you proud of, uh, what can you give us, and what can we put on the map as a, as a good example, as a best practice uh, and then we see that in this process you can really inspire each other uh, we see uh, some uh, common uh, issues that we have towards the goal that we are aiming and I think it's also very nice to see that if you combine your powers uh, I mean sometimes we regions are a bit competitive you know, every region wants to have the best region and we want to have the best impact on the circular economy uh, and we want to put ourselves on the podium. But if you see uh, that this is a big challenge we have to do together, you don't want to have one winner. You all want to be winners. So it, for, in order for us to all be winners, we combine the powers, we set the best practices, and also the dilemmas are now clearly in view and the, and the barriers. And for example, that gives us a strong position to talk to the national government and even the European government about legislation, about opportunities, about conditions that we need to uh, uh, yeah, promote this transition in the Netherlands in all regions. So I really hear about that way of identifying where the opportunities are, how to kind of combine your powers and to inspire each other. Are there other ways in which this power map has created value or impact? Yes, I think that the position of the provinces uh, as, as, as a midfielder, we have seen, said, uh, said that before when we started the conversations, uh, as, as a region, as a province, you are uh, a midfielder uh, in between the, the, the cities, uh, with, which are really uh, have a lot of contact with the citizens, with, the, with all the businesses that are there, lo located there at the places, but also the national government. We can have a, a, a bridge function uh, and, and we can make that stronger, that bridge. Great. And why do you think all of this power mapping and that collaboration and that bridging is important right now? I think the time that we have small projects, I think small projects are very important, but there was a time in the beginning that as local uh, uh, ministers or uh, mayors or, or uh, eldermen, we were very proud to have a nice project with a nice picture. We could have a, a cool uh, um, 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 momentum in the media. That We have passed that stage. We want to have a fundamental stage and that we can only do this together. And we can only do that when we have fundamental changes in uh, all aspects of society that has been mentioned before by other speakers and that's one of the reasons that we want to do this together. 
Thank you so much, Cora. And we're about to go to John Fernoy, but before we do, uh, he's here with Circular Friesland. We have a video to give you a sense of Circular Friesland before we speak to John. Let's watch that video together now. Before you set the course, you must first choose your destination. The province of Friesland has its destination in its sights. We want to be the most circular region in Europe. Why? Because we've been sailing this course for a while and our fleet continues to grow. In fact, Friesland is working to make our province circular in quite a unique way. Here, it's not just governments taking the initiative, but primarily the Frisian people themselves. They've charted a course towards circular living and working. Businesses, governments, non-profits and schools have come together to form the Circular Friesland Association. Throughout the province, we remain fully engaged with each other and work quickly and decisively. For example, we have the National Test Centre for Circular Plastics and Wetzers, the European Centre of Excellence for Sustainable Water Technology, an important enabler for the circular economy. In addition, Frisian education revolves around the circular economy, and we aim to make the Vodden Islands the most circular islands in Europe. The journey to becoming the most circular region in Europe is exciting, and we encourage other regions and countries to get on board. So join us on our voyage to a circular future. To find out more about the Frisian method, our projects, and our plans for the future, please visit circulairefriesland.frl. Great. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much for that video, uh, John, for sending that over. Can you introduce yourself shortly and the association you're working for uh, today? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is John van Hooy. I'm uh, the CEO of Omrin as a waste management company. And I'm also the chairman of uh, the Association of Circular Friesland. And uh, Circle of Friesland, we started with uh, 20 entrepreneurs or uh, companies in 2016. And we had the ambition to, uh, to build actually the most uh, circular region of Europe. And as we started with uh, the entrepreneurs, we wanted uh, to achieve this goal. And we said, if we can build this platform uh, together with uh, knowledge institutions and the government, we might have the best chance to, uh, to, to get a bottom-up movement and uh, actually to tackle the barriers uh, and, and to overcome them which we, from which we would face in order uh, for us that we want to achieve our goal. That's actually what we did. Great, thank you, John. And can you tell us a little bit more about what's unique about this cooperation? You're mentioning some of the actors, but can you speak more about what's unique about this collaboration in North Netherlands region? Uh, what's unique about this uh, collaboration is that we do this uh, together with uh, entrepreneurs, um, uh, knowledge institutions, and with uh, the government. And what we did is that we set an ambition and that we defined an, um, an vision on circular economy. And what's said already before uh, in, uh, in, in the lectures, it's broader than only recycling. It's, uh, it has to do with material reuse uh, and recycling. It has to do with clean energy. It has to do with biodiversity, but also with inclusivity. Everybody can uh, participate. And uh, what we are, are aiming at is just to put vision into action. Uh, also about circular economy, a lot is talked about it and a lot of visions are shared. But uh, in order to, uh, to make it happen, you should overcome uh, the challenges, but you should also invest in this uh, future um, that we all want. And what we did is that we built this uh, regional uh, program based on uh, the regional economic uh, strengths. And uh, we work on all those projects together with our members, we, uh, together with all uh, uh, the, the talents. And in that way, uh, we are, are able to share all the knowledge from what we learn, but also uh, uh, to conduct all kinds of business development and uh, projects uh, from, from where we can build bridges between all the members and uh, strengthen actually uh, uh, the region. 
And what was also said, I think it was from uh, the, the participant from Glasgow who said, from, uh, communication is very important, and that's what we involve also in, uh, in, in the campaigning and lobby activities. If you don't communicate, um, uh, nobody's going to, to know about you, you're not going to learn, and you're not going to connect to other parts in the world, and that's what we want. Great, thanks John. And I know that in Northern Netherlands, you're strong in sectors such as water technology, plastics, construction, agriculture. And so you're really looking across all of those sectors. And one thing that really inspired me was reading about how you have a commitment for all Frisian governments to go for 100% circular procurement, uh, which of course is a huge impact. Can you speak a little bit about how you feel like you can inspire other regions to take this path? Yeah, I think the, the main thing is that we built this platform where the governments, the knowledge institutions and the entrepreneurs or the companies said this is what we want. And if everybody plays his role, then it was very unique that uh, the, from the government said from we go for 100% uh, circular procurement because that um, it, 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 it uh, stresses innovation, it, it, it brings all kinds of activities where also the companies just uh, get into action. And um, I think that's, an, uh, that's a very important point. And uh, if I can have one slide back, because um, the five uh, main focus areas is plastics, where we defined also uh, goals, what we want to achieve there. It's a launching uh, customer ship just on, on, on procurement. The water that's uh, from, from where we built the, the European Center of Excellence, the agriculture, where we move towards an, uh, sustainable uh, farming and the construction, where we want to go for 100% building and construction in 2025. So it means it's very uh, concrete targets on all of those areas, which uh, combined uh, builds our uh, uh, economic strengths. And if I go one slide further, then I come to, uh, from to Omrin, and there is a lot of talk about, um, um, about waste management as a part of this uh, circular transition. Um, um, nowadays, we achieve already 80% reuse of all the waste uh, into new resources and new use. Uh, and we are um, also a supplier of clean energy. And uh, to make it more uh, concrete, all our trucks on the road drive uh, on the biogas pro produced from the gas. All the street lamps in Friesland, they are uh, burning just on the, uh, on the electricity from our waste incinerator. Uh, the street furniture is composed of uh, recycled plastic. And last but not least, we already printed the first three-day boat and, uh, and it didn't even sink. So uh, from that's what we learn and, uh, and we try to just evolve on that. Great, thank you so much, John, for this very inspiring example. I see from the chat that there is uh, interest in that circular procurement document. I'm sure we'll get that to you. Uh, really interesting. And uh, there was discussion in the chat as well about the importance of having political enabling structures. So to have higher ups um, give support for this. And that's what we're turning our attention to now. We're going to the federal government of the Netherlands to Arnold Passemir, who's the strategic international advisor on circular economy at the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. Welcome, Arnold. And um, I'm Interested because the Netherlands government is pursuing this goal of full circularity by 2050. How do you see the role of regions and provinces in reaching this goal? Now you heard um, the three others uh, talking about um, um, about what they do uh, to um, to engage uh, a lot of people, uh, not only businesses but also the the, the society, the citizens themselves. Uh, to um, to make it possible to uh, to change the economic system, um, but um, um, first of all, I think the um, what is really important to engage uh, all those uh, people is that you um, you um, create a, a, an inspiring uh, narrative, um, and that's about examples, good examples of what can be done um, in order to. Uh, uh, avoid waste, to um, avoid pollution, to um, uh, to be smart and efficient in your um, uh, material use, which is um, uh, yes, business-wise also for for companies. And what we did in in 2016 is create that um, uh, national um, uh, program on circular economy, 
And after that, we said we, we can't do it on, on our own as a as national government. We should engage um, all people. So we engaged the, the employers' union. We engaged the labor unions. We engaged um, uh, the regions um, um, and, the, uh, and the cities. Um, and we organized, um, within a couple of months, um, a national covenant on circular economy. And the national government covenant is important because it's, it showed how to uh, engage with each other um, to make concrete plans um, on all those type of topics like plastics, like consumer goods, like biomass and food, and, uh, and of course, building and construction, to, um, to see how to, um, how to organize ourselves together, um, to um, engage a lot of uh, people, but also to, um, to have um, um, inspiring goals to, uh, uh, to work at. Um, and it's not only about that, that covenant, but because that, that is only the starting point of, of what, uh, what we did. Um, we have regularly meetings uh, since then with the regions, uh, with um, the businesses, with uh, several other networks. Um, but um, uh, in the end, we said we need to help um, citizens and businesses to um, to find the new uh, innovations, to um, scale up the innovations in order to make them new defaults. Um, and therefore, we um, we initiated together with the employers' union and the, and the regional governments um, what we call an acceleration house, where all um, knowledge and experience about legal barriers, uh, about financial barriers, but also about regional uh, opportunities um, and best practices are shared, um, where uh, entrepreneurs, small and, and, and big, are connected to each other, but also to, um, to see how we can help them to, um, to um, make them th those innovations um, uh, scale up as soon as possible. So that, that sort of um, organism is uh, crucial, I think, to, um, uh, to make the circular economy work uh, on the local level. Um, but it's um, also about um, seeing that, that, that um, you look closely to the, the, to the strengths of, uh, of, your, um, of your region. Where is... Um, uh, the, the strength of your businesses. Uh, where is the strength of your society? And for that, we looked at um, regional, but also local hotspots, where we can show the, the public that it works. Um, and I can come to that uh, later on. But um, I think that focusing on um, on specific uh, uh, themes is crucial to um, to show results. So yes, yeah, so this national covenant, then those regular meetings with different sectors, acceleration house for spurring innovation, and then looking for where strengths lie within these regions. Can you give me another clear, concrete example of successful collaboration between the federal government and the provinces? Yes, one, one example is the, that we um, uh, started on the topic of, uh, of textiles. We uh, see in the Netherlands that there are four regions um, where um, the old textile industry was, but um, still there is a lot of knowledge and uh, entrepreneurship uh, on those topics. So we uh, said we should uh, focus on those four regions and uh, help with a, um, a national team uh, of experts uh, to, um, to accelerate uh, innovations uh, over there. The, the Dutch circular textile valley is a sort of um, uh, organism um, comparable with the, uh, the acceleration house where we uh, initiated um, uh, not only the regional focus, but also to um, engage um, companies in the value chain to work uh, together. And we have great examples of, uh, of how, that, uh, how that worked. Uh, and innovations are uh, coming into place Investments are are uh, done uh, to um, to make that possible. Uh, even Great. with even with uh, international collaboration with um, textile companies in in Turkey, by example. 
Yes, I know I really like this Dutch circular textile valleys and those local hotspots of circularity the circular craft centers, as you call them, uh, this idea that you bring together local waste collection centers, repair shops, secondhand shops into these centers, it makes a big difference. We won't have a chance to speak about the opportunity map in more, uh, more details. I know that that kind of gets you all in the same page, but perhaps let's move forward uh, instead, Arno, to speak about the challenges that your government encounters when uh, trying to bring this work forward. Yes, um, of course, we have a lot of challenges. We, um, um, I always say we, we started just now. Um, so we use still a lot of uh, resources which we waste. Um, so we, uh, we should um, look uh, critical to, to ourselves. But what we learned in the last couple of years is that we shouldn't look at um, only the materials themselves, the quantities of the materials and how to, to close the loop in, in that sense. It's crucial to close the loop and engage also the big industries um, uh, to um, uh, use the, 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 the highest quality of, uh, of products and, and materials. Uh, and that means that also the, uh, the waste sector, uh, the, the sorting recycling uh, sector, should um, focus more on, on the quality of the materials. And that's essential to, to close the loop. So that was one of the uh, learnings uh, of us. Uh, we um, were to look at and not only uh, go for the, uh, for the uh, quantitative um, uh, goals. Um, yes, go ahead. Yes, and um, secondly, it's very important that we um, are on the same page, that the discussions are not on definitions at, and um, uh, about the, the difficulties, but uh, to... Uh, to be inspired by each, each other to see how how fast we can go uh, to um, to the, to that um, uh, end goal of 2050, um, and that's uh, for sure what I experience with uh, with the provinces and the regions and uh, and the cities, is that in um, only uh, um, uh, yes one or two years we engage a lot of um, uh, stakeholders all on the same goal. And I didn't expect that uh, so quickly uh, to to see how how that is um, um, uh, how that uh, has been done. And one element is there very important, and that's that the national government is not um, overlooking what is uh, what is happening, but is really partnering um, uh, as a partner, uh, being a partner for all those uh, businesses. Uh, non institutes, NGOs, and regions, uh, because we um, we are uh, we need each other very much to um, accelerate that process of uh, towards the circular economy. So great, thank you so much, Arnold. Yes, I love this, both looking at quantity and quality of resources and creating demand, incentivizing downstream industry. But as you say, also the role of central government working with the regions and getting onto the same page and how quickly it can happen. We've had a lot of um, also thumbs up from uh, participants about this example from the provinces. Sarah, what have you seen as perhaps, let's say, perhaps one or perhaps two questions from the question and answer for our Dutch uh, colleagues. Sure, Vanessa, I think there's a lot of energy and enthusiasm about the circular Freshland example. And so I think it would be best if we ask John, um, number one, how have you funded circular Freshland? That's been one of the kind of the big questions across all the projects, but maybe if you could answer that, how it's funded. Um, and then kind of linked to that, one of the projects that you spoke about was creating uh, circular neighborhoods in the islands. Um, and maybe if you could talk about some of the core circular economy principles that are embedded there, that's linked to a question about um, looking at how you create circular neighborhoods, not just at the building scale, but kind of a wider neighborhood scale. So those were questions um, that I think are best for us to quickly answer here. Okay. Now, just to start about uh, the funding, um, we started off in 2016, and we said uh, we needed uh, per member 5,000 euros per year. We need a commitment for three years. You don't know what you get, but it's going to be fun. That was the, uh, the, from the starting point. And everybody was just, just uh, signing in. 
and uh, and that uh, gave us an obligation just also to deliver and to and to act and and to move things forward. And uh, if if we had this uh, from this money, we went to uh, the government to say, "Fun, can you double uh, the money we have?" And they say, "Yes, we want to do it." And uh, so that uh, brought us, uh, say, half a million uh, euros for, uh, on a yearly basis where we had to work with. And then we, found we got some money from Europe. And that uh, provided us with the means to, to build this association, to build this program, and to move things forward. Uh, but most important, to find where in the region was the energy with people who want to move uh, uh, this circular economy. And that was uh, actually what happens. And your second question about um, the, the circular neighborhoods, uh, especially at the Isles, uh, what you see is that the Isle is a very small community. Uh, at some Isles, maybe they have a thousand inhabitants or uh, 1,500 or something like that. So that's very uh, easy to control what uh, is moved towards the island and what is leaving uh, the island. So you can build programs on, uh, on what people use at the island. You can uh, build programs on the waste management. You can uh, build programs on the energy uh, and all kinds of, uh, of things like that. And that's what we work on. And of course, we uh, haven't achieved the ideal situation uh, yet. But uh, we are working on it and moving it closer and closer. And uh, as I think uh, millions of people uh, move every year to the islands, it's a great means of, commu of communication just to show uh, all the visitors how this can be done. So uh, marketing-wise, it's, it's an ideal platform to, to show uh, people how this circular economy uh, can work. Great. And Sarah, we have time for one more question. I think maybe we should take Desiree's question around shifting away from landfill and incineration to higher value add activities um, for waste that's that's generated um, within cities and regions. Um, and I know the Netherlands have been working hard at that for a number of years. So I wondered if that was something that one of our, our speakers from the Netherlands could touch on. Perhaps Cora or Tessa, from your experience being regional ministers of Drenthe and Flevoland, how are you moving away from the landfill incineration focus to this? Would Cora or Tessa would like to speak to that? Well, I can, I, I can take uh, say some things about it. Uh, I don't think we have a lot of landfill anymore, um, and that's that's that, that's very good. And incinerators, like John also said, we can use for 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 a lot of, of things, heating. Um, in, in neighborhoods, but also for for, for making uh, making energy. Uh, but when I may may jump to Europe, there we have we have a great job to do. And I think what is important, we help each other. We have also we need collaboration on on, on, on the level of the cities, but also on the international level. And 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 why should lands like Czechoslovakia or or or, or Poland? Build new incinerations when we can uh, help them to 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 make this transition to the circular economy, and 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 use their um, their waste so they can make a, a, a bigger step instead or from landfill to incineration to re to circularity. So so that's that's a cooperation we need in um, in, in Europe, I think. Well, a big thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for helping me with the question and answer. A big thank you to our Dutch colleagues, Arnoud, John, Cora, Chessa, for sharing this very exciting uh, initiative, both provincially but and also across the country. We're now going to the final closing reflections and roundtable. We've had such interesting insights and ideas that we were very interested to hear from all of you, the participants. And I'll turn to our speakers in a moment. What is a key takeaway? insight or idea that's really excited you from this session today. Let's use the wealth of the chat box. So share your key takeaway insight or idea so we can see what people are taking away with them on uh, from this from this session. Uh, for me, it's also really about the bold ambition combined with making it inclusive was something that came out for me. And for our speakers, thank you again for offering your insights. It's been tremendously valuable and it sees, shows us how we can have the potential to scale up our activities in cities and regions globally. In one word or phrase, what do you see as critical to scaling the circular economy transition in cities and regions? I'm gonna to come to our city uh, speakers, Annette, Gavin, and Jason first. So Annette, what would you say is a word or phrase you think is critical for scaling up as we move forward? 
I, I'm going to say ensuring that there remains a scale of scales. So um, not only looking on the major massive outcomes, but looking at, you know, a, a range of possibilities for intersections or pathways into achieving circularity. So ensuring that the scale of scales kind of remains open um, and accessible. Great. Gavin, a word or phrase from you. Oh, do we have Gavin there? Let's go to you, Jason, first. Um, yeah, I'd like to cheat and say all of it, but I think kind of just not being afraid to take chances, to innovate, and to try new things. Failure is a good thing. Let's learn from it. Let's let's all kind of share and, and help bring these good ideas to scale across the globe. Great. Thank you. Let's go to you, Ariana. Well, it's uh, important um, uh, to share uh, experiences, uh, success stories, uh, failures, but also to build up uh, some data. So not only uh, have uh, evidence that are data-driven, so data that are available regardless of the, 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 the sector, but really objective-driven. We have to build also new data, new indicators uh, to have an idea of how the circular economy is progressing over all. Great. Thank you, Ariana. Joanne. Yes, I think for me, it really is about, you know, new solutions and new ideas. And I think that really requires a deep commitment to collaboration and dialogue um, so that we can have that exchange and so that idea and innovations can scale up over time. Great. Thanks, Joanne. And actually, well, let's go back to our Dutch uh, colleagues. Chessa, for you, a word or phrase about what you think is critical to scaling the cities and regions role in circularity. I think we need leadership and we have to be positive. Circular economy is very, very positive and it's a message of hope. And I think we have to emphasize it again, again and again. Great. Thank you. Let's go to you, Arnold. Oh, Cora, let's go you, Cora. We'll flip over to the, yes, go ahead, Cora. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think uh, talking about perspective, that was the word that I wrote down. Uh, so I, I think we should ensure that the, the sh there's a shift in perspective so that businesses, they see the new economy as a place to be, as something that you cannot afford to miss out and that every business in the Netherlands, in Europe, in the world wants to be a part of that new economy. And if we can achieve that, then we can make a huge lap into the next generation. John. Yeah, um, what I'm dreaming of is actually a uh, man on the moon culture where we have uh, what we can ignite just in order to achieve our goal. And that's my message. Great. And our note. Yes, uh, use the energy of networks uh, um, to work towards new defaults. And that's more than. Uh, innovations and scaling up. It's after that. And there you have to, to focus on. Great. So this is great. And I'm seeing uh, comments also in the chat for getting money committed and then just going for it for three years and see what you'll come out with, but also, um, you know, keeping the message fresh, uh, which we've also heard from some of our panelists and many other takeaways and gratitude for sharing the cases we have today. Uh, I'm also grateful to all of you. Uh, big thank you from me and to Sarah as well for co-hosting this and to all the co-organizers. I'm going to hand it back to you, Sarah, to close us out for this uh, World Circular Climbing Forum accelerated session on circular cities and regions. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I think a standout kind of takeaway for me from the chat was a comment that Jan made about not just let's not talk about a circular economy, but let's talk about circular societies. And I thought that was a really fantastic takeaway um, from today's discussion because we really spoke a lot about it, the circular economy being people centric and we spoke a lot about collaboration and collaboration doesn't happen without people working together. So sadly, that's all we have time for, um, and we need to close the session. It's been a fantastic two hours of discussing how cities and regions can accelerate the transition to a circular economy. I think um, I just will also just apologize that we didn't get to all of the questions. I know we got to as many as we could. I'm sorry if your question wasn't asked directly, but I hope that we shared enough with you to walk away inspired um, and for you to be able to apply um, things that we've shared today in your work going forward. Please don't hesitate to reach out um, to us. 
um, if there was a specific question that you really would like us to answer and we'll try our best to do that. Um, there was a question as well about the session recording being shared. The session has been recorded and will be shared via the Canadian Circular Cities and Regions Initiative website. The slides that were presented today as well will also be shared on the website. And for those of you that registered directly, um, that registered, you will receive the, the recording and the slides directly as well. Um, so please do feel free, free to share the recording link um, with colleagues um, and if you need to you'll be able to watch it again as well I guess. Before we close I'd just like to say some thank yous. Um, so specifically thank you so much once again to our speakers for providing such an inspiring discussion today that um, thanks about an inspiring discussion has certainly been shared as well um, in the chat. Thank you so much to our audience for being so engaged and for asking such interesting questions. We really do appreciate all your participation. Um, thank you to everyone behind the scenes, um, to our collaborators and the organizers. I know there's been an incredible effort over the last several months um, to pull the session together. So thank you very much for all of that hard work behind the scenes. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for being a fantastic co-host. It's been a really great, great session um, and it's been fantastic to co-host with you. And so with that, we'll, we'll say goodbye um, and we'll see you again in another session um, soon to come. Thanks very much. Bye.